Hi, so I'm Mass Wilson, and I am part of this group in Copenhagen, this group of crazy people who are the first amateur organization in the world that are trying to build a rocket that can put a human being in space. And this might seem a little crazy to you, right? But actually, this is possible because the Americans and the Russians, they put the first person in space back in the 50s. The technology used back then were, were cutting edge. But today, the technology we have available to us, the things that you can buy in a normal hardware store, is actually sufficiently advi advanced to be able to build a rocket and put a man in space. We are based in Copenhagen. We have a workshop that are located in the old uh, Burmester and Wein shipyard. This is the, what you see here on the picture. And that is where we are working. Days, nights, weekends, once we have time from our day jobs. And this picture here I have chosen because you can see that little fine white line. That is actually the International Space Station passing over Copenhagen, just at the time when the first Danish astronaut, Andreas Mogensen, was aboard the space station. So that night we were all standing out there looking up and just like sharing our dream because basically where he was, that is where we want to go. So you might thinking, but how are they going to pull this off, right? Because launching a rocket is just not just something that, that you do. And it involves a lot of work and a lot of people. Actually, building the rocket is only a very, very small part. You also need a place to launch the rocket, right? You need to transport the rocket. You need all kinds of support systems. You need to have recovery because, I mean, whatever comes up also must come down, right? So what we are trying to do is not an orbital mission. We're not trying to, to, to put a human around the world. We're not trying to shoot for the moon, really, even though we probably will get quite close. We are trying to just build a rocket that can send a human being above the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers, that is the official boundary to space, and then making him come back safely again. And that is the important part, really, safety. Because when you're designing a rocket like this, and you're designing a rocket to put a man in space, everything is about that man, the human factors. Because everything you do design-wise is related to what does it take to make this human being survive the trip, right? And what you need to look at is what the human body can withstand. Because when you're lifting up from the ground in a rocket, you need to pick up immense speed. We need, with our rocket, we're talking about 3.5 times the speed of sound just to go up to 100 kilometers. So that acceleration that is put into that vehicle, your body needs to withstand. So it means that when you are in the rocket, it's not irrelevant how you, your body is oriented. That is why you see, when you look back at the, at the, uh, at the space flight, uh, the, uh, the, the, moon, the moon flights back in the 60s, the astronaut was always lying on his back because that is the position where the human body can take the most acceleration. But doing that, you will have a very big capsule, and we cannot handle that. So what we have done instead is we have consulted with, we have some doctors on our team, and we have found a way where we can actually do the next best thing, which would be to have the astronaut like this, like in a cannonball position in a small capsule, and that means that we can build a capsule that is one meter, in one meter in diameter, and that capsule can then sit atop a 15 meter rocket, and we can just hurl our astronaut into space. So, what does it take to be our first astronaut? Well, you need to be small, light, you need not to be that afraid of small spaces, right? Uh, you also need to be very fit, because, because the stress that you are putting on your body is actually quite uh, immense. Also, you need to have some tolerance of the sea, because we are launching from sea on a floating platform that we build ourselves. And the astronaut needs to be placed in the rocket a long time before launch. So just imagine you sitting atop a 15-meter rocket on a platform that is just slowly moving beneath you in this little can in the summer heat while all your friends are running around checking wires, fixing things and just waiting for that shot, right? So, so you, need, you need to be very tolerant of, of those kinds of stress. 
So I'm going to explain the mission. I said before that this is a suborbital mission. So basically it means that we have the rocket on the platform and if the astronaut hasn't died or fainted yet, <laughs> just by sitting in the can, then we will be ready to, to lift him off. And then the, the engine will, will uh, ignite and it will burn for 90 seconds. In those 90 seconds, the astronaut will be hurled from zero to 50 kilometers and the rocket will have a speed of 3.5 times the speed of sound. Then the engine stops. And at that point, that would also feel like be kicking a, a kicked in the head by a horse because then you have deceleration because all of a sudden the engine just stops, right? But the rocket itself will still have enough speed to reach another 50 kilometers. So we reach the common line, the edge of space, and then, then now, the for, now the fun part starts. <laughs> because then the capsule will, will be separated from the rocket. And because we are in free fall and almost weightless, it will just start tumbling, tumbling around. So he'll be looking out of his little window, just seeing the Earth go by like that, right? And whatever goes up must come down. So the capsule will just start falling, and then it's very important that we orient the capsule the right way, because all that energy that we have built up in the rocket and the capsule, that energy must go somewhere. And the only way that, that we can get rid of that energy is by the heat shield. So the, the, once we start hitting the atmosphere, then the, the air around the capsule will start heating up. And it, from the astronaut's point of view, it would just look like everything is burning around him. So he's coming down through the atmosphere, and then at about three or four kilometers, we will release the parachutes. Hopefully, they will work. And then he will land safely in the water. And now the real, really dangerous part begins. Because he will be lying in the water, maybe 20 or 30 kilometers away from the launch site. So we need to sail over there. We need to try to foresee where he will land, and we need to sail over there to get him. So that's going to be very interesting, just lying there bobbing around in a little capsule. This is, all, this is not all fantasy. I mean, we have been building rockets since uh, 2008, and we have launched quite a few. And back in 2014, we actually had what we thought would be our big rocket. But sometimes things doesn't go as you expect. Five. What you see here is the result of a very, very small design flaw. We built a big rocket. We were very confident that we had everything in place. We could build this rocket and we could do the first shot to 100 kilometers with this rocket. Not with a man inside, just to prove it, just to check all the flight events. And then we tested this in our test stand and, and what you see here is the engine rupturing and all the alcohol, all the fuel in the tanks just spilled out in two seconds. And that fire that created was then fed by pure oxygen, just pouring out of the rocket. So everything burned, right? I was standing in the bunker next to it, like 100 meters away, and everything just went up in this huge fireball. And I looked at the people around me, and I could see the disappointment on their faces. I mean, thousands of hours just lost right there. But then, after a minute or so, once they have recovered themselves, they, they eyes, eyes start lighting up again, and I could see that they were just thinking, hey, let's go build another one. <laughs> and that is actually what we did. We built two rockets. We, we scrapped everything, and we just said, okay, we need to start over. We need to create smaller rockets that are easier to build and easier to handle so that we can try out all the flight events. And that is what we did with the Nexo mission. We launched the Nexo 2 rocket, just three weeks ago from the Baltic Sea, and that was a huge success. We managed to get precisely the flight profile we needed. We managed to, to try out and succeed with all the steps that we need for the manned mission. What you see here is the video that was recorded by the onboard cameras of the rocket. So you can see it taking off from the platform. You can see the side view camera just looking out. That would be what the astronaut will see when he is flying. And underneath it, you can see the small blinking light. The small blinking light is actually just a little feature we put in so that we could see that the camera was working because that camera is looking into the parachute department. It is looking upwards. And the huge thing about this mission was that we needed to see that parachute go out. All the rockets we have sent up previously have had several flaws, but the biggest one was that none of them really came down in a parachute. 
So that is what we really, really wanted, and that was the icing on the cake that day. That was to see first, because we could see the live feed, we could see the nose cone separating, and we could see, could see the parachute coming out, and then later on when we sat in mission control and were looking out, we can see this. We can just see the rocket coming down slowly in its parachute. This is the team that built and launched the rocket. But our team is actually much bigger than the 50 people working on this. Because the way we fund all this, we all work for free, so we put in our hours, but the way we, f we fund it is that we have people from all over the world that share our dream. People who think that this is actually possible. And then they sign up as supporters and just pay a small fee, a small amount of money, to us every month, and that is what we use for rent and materials and fuel and everything. So we are not just a team of 50, we are actually a, a team of several thousand people all over the world. And if you count in all the people that are following us on social media, people that we put out videos and blogs so that they can see what it is we are doing, then we are tens of thousands of people all over the world. And this is important because you can have a dream, you can have a small group that has a dream. But once you start lifting that dream, and once you start just inspiring other people, that is when the real fun starts to happen. Because, because once you are people from all over the world with all their contacts, all their knowledge, all their ideas, then you can do things that are truly, truly, truly amazing. So I actually think deep from my heart that someday we will succeed. It might take some time, and we might bang our head against the wall several times. We have done that already, right? We might run out of money at some point, but we will try. And then someday, we will not be looking up, but actually we will be looking down, just as Andreas, the Danish astronaut, did those days, where he actually, while we were looking up at the space station, he sent us this picture as a greeting, saying, hey guys, I'm, I'm cheering for you, and I really, really hope that your mission, mission succeeds. And that's all. Thank you.